Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We've got a big show for you this week. News editor Joel Stocksdale spent the weekend, basically, in Monterey and Pebble Beach. Lots of big reveals out there and some other news going on. We'll also talk about what we've been driving. He's been in the Audi R8. I've been in the Toyota Sienna. A little bit of a different uh, different world there, but hey, uh, and we do have some uh, some of your money to spend. With that, let's bring in Joel. Welcome back from California. How you doing? Hey, you doing all right. Uh, feeling kind of tired. It was a busy, busy weekend. <laughs> I remember uh, when I was sort of starting out in this business, if you will, some of the like senior guys would get to go and I'd be like, hey, you're bringing your golf clubs. And they're like, nope, this is the hardest weekend of work all year. So it's a lot of work out there at Pebble. And even if you wanted to golf, the Pebble Beach golf course is closed up because there are cars on it. That's true. The uh, I forget if it's the 9th or the 18th fairway is cars, which is, hey, I like golf. I like cars. It seems like a great way to put it together. One year I did golf. Uh, I forget, but it wasn't at Pebble because <laughs> that's a that's not exactly a, an easy course to access, although it is doable. But I did golf out there once. I digress. No one cares about that. Let's talk cars. Uh, the Mustang GTD. Wow. Uh, this one, uh, I think it's fair to say it kind of came out of nowhere. We weren't really expecting like a $300,000, uh, I would call it a Mustang supercar uh, that is basically a race car that you can drive on the track. This has Jim Farley written all over it in my book. A guy who loves to race, who loves the Mustang. Um, and, you know, I think they've said they're going to let the Mustang kind of run out in this sort of form until we're done with internal combustion engines, whenever that may be. So I feel like there is some pressure on them to kind of create some buzz around this this generation. This certainly did it. Uh, you saw it out there. I imagine this this turned some heads out there at Pebble. Yeah. And it's hard for me to gauge exactly how much buzz because I got to the my, I got to the Ford display right about the same time that there was a jet flyover um, at the Quail. So a lot of people's attention had turned to the skies for a little bit. But it is an extremely cool vehicle. And I think the yeah. thing that I am most impressed with it is the fact that it's supposed to be street legal. Like, we've seen we've seen oodles of specialty track day vehicles from supercar builders that are built without any kind of like racing series in mind or and also have no equipment for running on the street. It's literally just to be the fastest track day thing that they can build. And frankly, when I saw photos of this thing, I was like, oh, this is clearly the Mustang version of that. It's like, it's not really for any kind of racing series. It's just for a Mustang fan that wants the fastest thing that they can get on the track. But apparently you'll be able to drive this on the street so you can parade around on Woodward Avenue and stuff with it, which is honestly really cool. That's cool. I like that when they... You know, track only cars, we see them sometimes from like, especially the European exotics. They're cool to look at. Doesn't really do that much for me. Not that I'm going to be able to pick up a, you know, a Mustang GTD for 300 grand. But I mean, if I did get what is a press car, I could drive it on Woodward, like you said. Whereas some of these other, you know, again, some of these very low, you know, niche Ferraris, Lamborghinis, et cetera, they're, that's what they are, is they're off roaders, if you will. So. Uh, and like, this is a wild car. And I think what why it's so impressive to me is that if you're just building something for the track and you're not building it for either racing or for on the street, in some ways, that's easy because mm -hmm. you have no constraints. You can you literally can do whatever you want because like it basically just has to like <laughs> have a seat and seat belts and yeah wheels like you don't have to worry about uh having lights and things that meet regulations and stuff so it's that kind of extra level of like building a crazy track day car 
and also going through all of the effort and trouble and difficulty of making sure that all of this, you know, is legal. That's, you know, that's a legitimate challenge. Even like, even like for regular road cars, obviously these automakers do it all the time. So like they're up to the challenge, but you know, it's still a challenge nonetheless. And so, you know, it's impressive and it's cool. And, and it also means that uh, more people might actually get to see the car too. It's true. It's um, I think it's kind of like the ultimate flex. If you're like a super rich guy who loves Mustangs, I mean, this is by far the top of the food chain of the current chain. I mean, I would imagine this is worth more than even some of the rarest or cost more than some of the rarest, most expensive vintage Mustangs. So um, pretty gaudy price tag, 800 horsepower. Um, it's interesting. They didn't go electric. You know, they didn't make anything. This is like a real like, you know, V8 race car, if you will, which I think is cool for what they're going for. Um, the design is over the top. I mean, even for a race car, I think it's really um, pretty wild. If you put this in like the GT3 class, it would stand out. You know, a lot of those cars look fairly street spec with just bigger wings and different tires. I mean, you look at the arrow, like the arrow on the front quarter panels there. Uh, it's, I think it's four inches wider than the current Mustang. A lot of that is like, you know, the way those fenders come out, but also those big tires, 20 inch wheels. You can get optional magnesium wheels. Uh, they use carbon fiber for like the drive shaft. Really interesting uses of materials for this. I mean, it really is like a, a rolling prototype of everything you could do to a Mustang on steroids. Yeah, it's it's sweet. And it's kind of an interesting counterpoint to say the Dodge Demon 170. Yeah. I mean, it's completely different vehicles, but both yeah. of them very cool. And also, they I feel that they kind of sum up the differences between each vehicle. Yeah. Whereas the Demon is very much old school muscle drag car and the Mustang has evolved into something more like a proper sports car. I think it really, yeah, I mean, you said it great. It shows the divergent paths these two cars have taken since, you know, the Mustang came back in 2005 as like a retro styling, never left, but it became more retro in 05-ish. And then the Challenger came back overtly retro. For a while, the Mustang Camaro and Challenger were somewhat comparable, even though the Challenger was always kind of like the, you know, the coupe in name only. It was just this, you know, big, heavy car that was powerful and kind of all over the place. Mustang and Camaro weren't, I would say, truly the like the most cutting edge sports cars. But Chevy and Ford kind of went this way. Dodge has really lead into like, we're going to make street legal drag racers, it seems like at this point. And then here you have Ford saying, well, OK, you do that. We're going to make a basically a street legal, you know, Lama car or something. So it's cool. I dig it. I would love to drive this thing one lap. That'd be cool. You know, even if it's just at like parade speeds or driving on the streets, like open streets. Uh, I, th I think it's great. I think they nailed it. I think you see Jim Farley's fingerprints all over this thing. You know, he, this is the kind of thing he, like, I think that he's CEO, he gets to do, you know? So yeah, that's the Mustang GTD. Uh, let's uh, skip around here. The Pininfarina B95. I mean, that's another kind of really, you know, impressive, if you will, uh, thing from Pebble Beach. You saw it. Did you see it on the concept lawn or was it the coil? Like, where was this thing? So I caught the Pininfarina at the quail. Okay. And it it is quite cool. Yeah. And honestly, the thing that jumped out at me uh, right away besides the bright yellow and gray paint and lack of windshield were the uh, houndstooth seat backs. I like them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's slick. And you know, because, because it's the quail, uh, there was somebody sitting in it. I'm assuming a prospective customer um, and was, they were being talked to by a representative from Pininfarina, probably, I don't know, discussing features and options and well, price tag probably never came up because, you know, if you've got to ask, yeah. you can't afford it. 
Well, we said it's uh, four point eight million. Uh, so hey, that's not cheap. No. Kind of reminds me of the Ferrari Monza SP two. One hundred percent. You know, which is a re- kind of a deep cut from even the current Ferrari catalog. But um, here's a strange thing: I saw an SP two at at the Woodward Dream Cruise. I looked over and I'm like, I think this car show is getting is like Woodward's getting a little bougie here, like. When you're seeing these exotic, super rare models, but you know, there's a lot of, <clears throat> you know, a lot of car collectors who have those like sort of cottage garages and they keep stuff like that in there. But yeah, it's pretty cool. I think, you know, Pitt and Farida went through some transitions and I think it's very cool that they're able to still produce stuff like this. I know some of their, like their long running relationship with Ferrari for decades was basically kind of ended so the fact that they've been forced to retrench they're still doing cars um for a while like their design like house was even was doing everything from like watches to coffee makers stuff like that um so i think this is really cool and doing it at the coil is you know again a great way to do it i really like the coil too um have you you've been how many times have you been to the coil i've only been to the coil twice so far okay so far, you plan on going next year? Well, I don't know about next year, but yeah, I I'm, like the coil. You know, the the longer you stay in this business, the more the more times you do get to go yeah. out to Pebble Beach and stuff. Yeah, I like the coil. I think in some ways it I don't know if chiller is the right vibe, but you see a lot of cool stuff there. Um that you might not even see at the Codcore, you know, because some of the newer stuff like the Mustang, this Pininfarina, some other stuff we'll talk about. That's where the car makers show it. Whereas at Pebble, it's it's all the vintage, which is awesome too, of course. But you know, stuff like this might get relegated to like the concept lawn, which is in front of um, the lodge, as they call it, as they humbly call the hotel at the Pebble Beach um, on the grounds. There, it's it's actually a great clubhouse too. If you're ever again, if you're a golf fan and you have a press pass or something wander through the lodge it's like a hall of fame of golf stuff you know i would you know maybe tmi but there's anytime you have to go to the bathroom the grounds are open you can go into the lodge and use their facilities and you can see a lot of cool car and golf stuff let's put it that way um also if you are looking ahead to the detroit auto show i just saw a uh press release this morning that paulo pininfarina of pininfarina will be speaking at the auto show that's kind of cool. Get uh, a bit of an international flair. Um, yeah, I thought this was cool. Anything else you think about this one, or should we move on? Uh, well, it, it is kind of funny how you mentioned that Penn and Farina and Ferrari have kind of Split parted season. ways a bit. And yeah. the first thing that we both thought of when we saw this was, hey, that looks a lot like a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> but... I suppose some of that is to be expected considering how long Pin and Farina was designing Ferraris. Yeah. And for a long time, it was almost like necessity, I think, even going back to the days of Enzo. You know, he was like, I own a race car team. I make cars for these stupid people who want to spend money on them, but I do it because I have to. He was pretty condescending if you read books on him and things like that. Uh, what was he? L commentador or something his nickname was something imperial like that um so they let pitted free to do the design basically for most of their cars and that went on for years there were some notable exceptions of course but i mean pin and free to design a hell of a lot of ferraris so yeah i mean it's obviously if they're looking into their heritage i mean pin and farina's heritage is ferrari so yeah if you're going to go into the catalog for design this will work i think um this is a cool one, though. I like what they did with it. I think, um, uh, you know, again, if you're a Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg type of, guy, type of guy who's looking to spend a lot of money, like these are the rare pieces of art that you can also drive and try to pick up. So, And this uh, one's electric. So yeah, don't have to feel guilty about that. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, I guess we could go to the Lambo Lanzador. That's quite the name. Um, I kind of like it, actually. I like the design of this, too. Uh, 
maybe a little bit of a surprise. You know, they show off what they're doing as far as electric, um, which they haven't been, frankly, quite as um, overt about, if you will. Reminds me a little bit of a little bit of the Urus, but it's also um, it's got that very like. Um, you know, stereotypical wedge design you see there. I even see a little bit of like a Lancia Stratos or something from back in the day in there. Um, but I, I'm intrigued by this one. What do you think? Yeah, I was, uh, th truthfully, when I first saw the photos, I was, I wasn't quite sure about it. It, I felt like it either looked a bit kind of like a squished Urus or, a kind of a stretched out Aventador. Yeah, but in person, I like it quite a bit more. It looks a little leaner and meaner. Uh, it doesn't look quite as mm, thick around the middle, <clears throat> and it's got a lot of neat detailing on it. It's got lots of active arrow that is actually quite subtly hidden, which is a little bit weird to say about a Lamborghini. One of the things that's really neat, like in the and the wheel arch openings, the carbon fiber cladding around it, there are little holes in it, and those those are vents that are actively opened and closed for downforce or for reducing drag as needed. And it's got an absolutely gorgeous interior. It's this blue wool with brown leather, and it's really cool kind of floating jet fighter cockpit dashboard and stuff it's it's pretty neat it's got quite a bit of ground clearance too so it looks i don't know a little bit it remind it reminds me of the huracan Storado, honestly yeah i was thinking that too and i do think it's neat that it's it's a two-door like it's long enough and has enough space like between the wheels that I think like it could have been a four door if they really wanted it to, but you know, they kept it as two door and I think that's neat. That's something that, you know, doesn't come up as much. And like, I, I talked a little bit with the chief technical officer from Lamborghini and, and he was saying, he was just like, I mean, they're still going to have the Urus. So, you know, that's their four door. So they can, they can do two door on this. This speaks to like a kind of a broader trend that I wish OEMs would do, which is kind of take a look back at two doors, you know, whether it's something like this or like off roaders, you know, where like, yes, you could get, and I'm going off, off the, you know, script here a bit, but yes, you can get a two door Wrangler and a Bronco, but wouldn't you love like more like a full size off roader, like a two door, you know, something larger, like, going back to the days of like a K5 or something, you know, I just feel like there's a market for that. And obviously vastly different segments here, but um, I like it. I really do. I think this is uh, a very solid move for Lambo. I don't, did they say what this name means? Uh, I feel like Lambo has been doing some weird stuff with names lately. Like I, I thought the Urus was not the best way to badge an SUV, but did they say what Lanzador is? You know, I didn't catch exactly what it means. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's what Google's. That's what Google's for. We'll figure it out. But um, I do think it sounds good. Yeah, it's all right. I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Alfa Romeo is a little better at names with like in Maserati too, like Italian passes, uh, Alps passes, strong winds, things like that. Um, so yeah, all right. Uh, let's talk about the Acura ZDX 500 horsepower, uh, kind of previews a bit of what they're going to do next, uh, as far as just, uh, you know, again, where they're going. Acura usually shows up for Pebble Beach pretty well, I think is a brand that obviously hasn't been around as long as say Mercedes or BMW or Cadillac, frankly, almost nobody else has. Uh, I think they still view themselves as a challenger brand. They show up for Pebble Beach. They try to do concepts that um, and show production cars there that really, you know, stand out. So uh, this is another one I like. I think um, 
I've liked Acura's design for the last probably five, six years. I think the long hoods, um, the big wheels, the creases, the grills, I think they've kind of figured out the grill finally. So I like this one. What do you think? Yeah, this is another one that in photos, I was not particularly enthused about it. I thought, okay. I thought it looked fine, but it wasn't blown away. But again, in person, I think it looks better and kind of similar reasons as the Lamborghini. It looks a little bit, a little bit leaner kind of for lack of a better word. It has kind of like a long, low nose and an actually fairly upright cabin area. And uh, it just makes it look a little less bubbly. Like, I think a lot of modern day SUVs that are unibody and kind of front wheel drive based, they've gotten a little bit bubbly, uh, kind of closer to sort of almost a minivan kind of one box shape purely because I mean that's that's practical and as you're trying to get more space everywhere inside kind of slowly migrate to that and I think maybe with a kind of a fresh powertrain ZDX kind of offers the flexibility to kind of change up the design granted a lot of those front wheel drive SUVs are starting to kind of move back into sort of a more boxier kind of traditional mm -hmm. SUV shape, kind of like Honda Pilot, Kia Telluride. But this, I think, goes even a step further. And yeah, it looks it looks kind of low and sleek and you know, it's a it's a good looking vehicle. All right, so let's close up the news section with uh, some news out of Fisker. The Alaska pickup uh, debuted. Uh, it was actually before Pebble Beach. They were there um, in Monterey in 22 with the, uh, the I believe it was the ocean concept um, or the ocean. Uh, but this year, uh, they just kind of rolled out the Alaska and they did some other product news um, before that, uh, you know, earlier announcing like the pair, the Ronin, uh, come up with some interesting names here. Let's put it that way. Um, but truck is not really one that, I necessarily thought Fisker would do, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you look at like the segment uh, where there's opportunity, um, people like trucks, people like electric trucks, Alaska sounds kind of good. I think this, uh, you know, this again, Fisker needs to make and deliver cars. So we'll see, but I think this could be good for them. Yeah. I, you know, I've seen the pictures I think it looks nice for the yeah. most part. Uh, I think that if it's sized maybe a bit more along the lines of like the Rivian R1T or heck even maybe slightly smaller, that would be a good niche to go for as opposed to trying to take on Ford, Chevy, Dodge, and maybe Tesla if Cybertruck is really happening. Um, in the full size market. That being said, I do feel a lot of anxiety around Fisker dropping all of these models that they're like, yeah, we're going to build all these things. And they're only just getting their current production vehicles out the door and, you know, dropping what, like three new models all at once at, yeah i don't know it makes me nervous it makes me worried that they might be kind of splitting their resources and spreading them too thin and also when you know they should probably focus on making sure that they get this first car out the door in significant quantity and without any issues before getting too ambitious about additional models. So Yeah, I think I think you're totally spot on there. This is a lot of vehicles for a company that, you know, frankly is just kind of hanging in there, you know. I so. mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of like any automaker where that has been a good move. 
Like one of the one of the things that stands out really strongly in my mind was years ago when Lotus yeah. said like, hey, yes. here's the like it's seven free. different things that we're gonna yeah. build in the next like five years. Mm-hmm. And boy, that didn't happen. I was at that auto show in I believe Paris, I think it was. They had like four or five concepts. Every Lotus you could ever think of from the great history, they had a thing. Obviously, it was a bunch of vaporware. Um, I remember that. It was like the last presser of the day, and people kind of knew what it was coming. But yeah, man, same same jam as they just, you know, kind of overpromised and underdelivered. I mean, in Fisker's case, it's a little, it seems like it's overkill here. Like all you need to do, and I've argued this before. You don't need to be GM. Just be whoever you are, you know? Like Rivian, I think, has a great business case. Two vehicles in the heart of the market that's lucrative, outdoorsy, premium feel, interesting. That's all you got to be, you know? You don't need to, like, fill every segment like it's 1954, you know? So I think the pickup truck, yes. City car, no idea what they're doing there. Nobody needs a city car right now. The what is a three hundred eighty five thousand dollars supercar? I mean, okay, your Fisker, I get it. Hedrick designed all those Aston Martins and BMW Zs. Sure, you probably want to do something like that. Maybe you could kind of, you know, appeal to the crowd that doesn't spring from the Monza or the Pininfarina. But yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think they're overreaching here. Stuff looks good though. I mean, as you would expect, you know, Hedrick Fisker knows his way. You know around like a sketch pad as far as being a great designer, but I don't know. seems like a lot here. Yeah, and I think the Alaska is neat, and I think it kind of looks like a vehicle that could be marketed more as kind of a niche lifestyle vehicle as opposed yeah. to trying to take on traditional truck buyers directly, which I think would be the smart move because I, because I think there are a lot of buyers that don't necessarily need or want like a conventional full-size pickup truck. Yeah. Kind of, you know, kind of like almost Subaru Outback type buyers that I think like Hyundai Santa Cruz is kind of targeting. And I think that would be a good move to make. But yeah, I don't know. I'm just can I just have concerns. <laughs> I think the ocean and the Alaska all day long. I think those look great. And I think there's probably a pretty good business case for those. Uh, the, the tricky part about doing a supercar, if you're not, say, Ford, that is like, hey, let's make a $300,000, 800 horsepower Mustang, is all the resources it takes to make it good. So, I mean, I'm a rich dude who wants to spend money on a convertible. Is Fisker what I'm thinking first? I don't think so. I think I'm thinking, let's get one of those Mustangs or Hey, Maradello, what can I get out of waiting list for you? I just, I don't know. Um, again, stuff looks good, though. Of so. course, I, I kind of feel like the Ronin almost makes more sense for them than the pair. Because with something like the Ronin, you can just charge whatever it costs to, to develop and make it. Because there will yeah. be a rich person that can afford it. Fair. Whereas with the pair being kind of an affordable yeah. vehicle the margins are super slim the buyers will not tolerate problems because you know they have a tighter budget themselves and can't necessarily afford to have a vehicle that is causing them problems and is either going to be down or is going to cost them money to fix and you kind of have to make up for a lot of that with volume and I don't know if Fisker can handle that kind of volume. Um, and if they can, if they can do it with like consistency, consistency in quality and reliability, maybe they can. And I mean, I'm not saying that even if they don't necessarily have that right now, that they couldn't, but again, it, it's concerning. I, I, I agree with you that, if they can focus on like ocean and Alaska, that would be a good like two product lineup for a few years while they kind of get everything going. 
Yeah. I mean, that's that's the Rivian playbook. Again, Alaska looks really cool. I like when you think, hey, would I be willing to take a flyer on that as like my EV truck? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But and I agree with you. Like city car, dude, what do you like? It's almost like, what are you guys doing? Like, there's no market for that in the US. Um, you know, don't tell me you're gonna try to sell this in Europe or other overseas markets where you know, you'd have to stand up uh, like some sort of dealer network. Uh, I, I don't think they've even said that. Uh, I hear you. It does make more sense to be like aim for the pie in the sky with the Ronin versus the city car. Um, and now at this point, uh, we, we've probably droned out about Fisker. And there are, who knows how many of these they'll actually make. So we should probably switch over to the drive section. Um, <clears throat> I think we should lead off with the Audi R8. If we're going to go with you know, Toyota Sienna minivan versus Audi R8 in Laguna Seca. I think I know what people want to hear more about. You got a couple laps in, probably the last laps out of track for an R8 for a new one. That must have been cool. Yeah, it was cool. And it it was altogether too brief. Yeah. <laughs> we we literally got two laps and not not quite two full not quite two full speed laps granted i'm still happy to have gotten just a little bit of a taste of an r8 but but boy it it went by fast it and laguna seca is it's a good size track but not like super super enormous you have so, some turds there too turds and curves where you got to be on your toes yeah, and Obviously. actually, so I've I've driven Laguna Seca before. Granted, that was in Fiat Abarths. It was the 124 Spider Abarth and the 500 Abarth. So this was a significant step up in speed. And one of the things that you know when I when I first drove Laguna Seca, I was expecting the corkscrew to be like, whoa, this crazy kind of like roller coaster type corner. In retrospect, well, and even like the first time I went down, I was like, you know, the corkscrew isn't quite as scary in person when you're actually driving down it as it looks from like the from the spectator perspective on the other side of the fence. <clears throat> And actually, most of the track wasn't particularly scary in those Fiats. Driving the R8, what did kind of scare me is that first little kink of a corner on the front straight, where the front straight is going up, and then it's kind of this blind kink corner that then goes down. So you're going very fast to a little, to, it almost doesn't look like a corner, <laughs> like on a map. But it is enough of one that you do have to be aware of it. And you're going really quick. And all of a sudden, like, the whole car unweights as you're going over it. And it's a little bit off camber. So that was actually the scariest part of the track for me. Interesting. Um, because I was like, oh, it just because it just doesn't quite feel like <laughs> you have the grip. And it, I don't know, it, it almost feels like you might just kind of skip off into the into the gravel whereas like with the corkscrew you know it's coming and it's a significant enough of a corner that you're going to be getting hard on the brakes and slowing way down for it and that that makes things far more relaxed <laughs> and as you're coming out of the corkscrew, that lower corner is on camber, so you've got a little bit of extra kind of grip coming around it. So that's kind of my opinion. Corkscrew is actually not that scary, but that front straight, that that front straight kink, that's that's a little bit that can be a little bit scary. I drove a um I forget what they called it, but it was a similarly styled um turn curve setup at the General Motors Proving Ground in Milford, Michigan. And I was, believe it or not, in all things, I was in the Buick Regal GS. Um, this was a while ago. When these were like German, you know, inspired, designed, tuned uh, vehicles. And 
you know, to echo your statements, your thoughts, you go through the curve, you're almost not thinking about it because the only thing you can do is get through the curve. You know, there's, it's all reflex, it's all instinct, and then it's over. Whereas there's other, I think, more like lugger sweepers. We have more time to set it up, more time to get it wrong. You know, uh, I have not driven Laguna Seca. I would love to. Um, but it, it strikes me, and maybe you tell me what you think. It's more like a pass fail thing. You know, you're either through it or you're in the gravel. And that's sort of how the so called Lutz ring is what they used to call this part of the Milford Proving Grounds after. Uh, happy 90th birthday birthday there, Bob. He just turned 90. Um, Bob Lutz, uh, the Prove It Grounds. So, yeah. Yeah. And overall, I mean, Laguna Seca is a really great track. And yeah. what's also great is like a Monterey Motorsports reunion is that there's lots of great places to watch the racing. And the corkscrew mm-hmm. is actually one of them because the hill yeah. going up to there there's lots of shade. There's lots of space to kind of set up on the hill and just sit and watch. And like, you can see the cars coming down from the top down to the bottom. It's a really great place. But as for the R8. Yeah. So I've, I'd never driven an R8 before. This was my first time. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, well, and I think a big part of that is just the fact that I really, so I got hired at, auto blog in 2016 and it's really kind of my first real like writing job out of college i was briefly a car and driver but i wasn't doing writing there and yeah the second generation r8 so this generation it the first model year for here i think was 2017 and there well there was no way i was going to be sent on on a trip for that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And completely, completely reasonably. And, you know, the car hasn't really changed that much since 2017. So it's never really been in fleets much kind of during the time that I've been around that I've been doing this. So I've, I've never had the opportunity to drive one. And well, so part of the reason the, the number of laps was so minimal was the fact that we're doing our lapping sessions in the middle of Rolex Monterey motorsports reunion. They must've had to pay a little bit of money to get that time of track time. Let's put it that way. Oh, for sure. And they only had two R8s to drive. Oh, okay. Uh, They had an all-wheel drive one and a rear drive one. I took the all-wheel drive one, which uh, worked out well because the the other person that was on my stint had never driven the rear drive one, so wanted to drive that. And I kind of wanted to drive the all-wheel drive one because for the most part, the R8 has always been all-wheel drive. Yeah. And so that kind of seemed like sort of the definitive version if I'm going to drive one. Plus, uh, having a little bit of extra traction isn't necessarily a bad thing if I've never driven this thing before and it's very fast and we're not going to have a whole lot of time to get comfortable with it. (laughs) So, yeah, the drive, it first off, super comfortable and like great driving positions. It's really nice and low. It was easy to get comfy and relaxed. Uh, driving position was nice. The All the controls and stuff were very driver centric. The Audi's digital instrument cluster with the pseudo analog tachometer was really easy to read when going fast and not being super familiar, which was great. I was actually able to like manually shift it um transmission super fast super smooth v10 sounds fantastic it's gonna be sad to see that it's gonna be sad to see that engine go and it is absolutely like what you expect from a high revving naturally aspirated engine it makes all of its power up high it's very progressive power which is nice, especially if you're not super familiar with the car, because it's not going to 
like whack you in the back of the head or kick the back end out super suddenly with the turbos hitting it's it works all very smoothly and uh, precisely steering is light and super accurate uh the whole car is just kind of relaxed like it it, it wasn't taxing to drive it which again was good because again i'm not familiar with the car and so i was able to kind of mostly just focus on on the driving it kind of just you know did what you wanted did feel a little bit wiggly coming down some of the downhill corners as i got on the brakes but nothing nothing to be like concerned about and with all wheel drive it you know, it would get a little bit, just a, little, just a hint of understeery, getting on throttle in the corner. Um, traction control light was blinking at me a lot. Um, That's the idea. Pro- probably because I was being, well, so not ham-fisted, but I guess ham-footed, um, okay. I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, I, I'm i sure if I was a little bit smoother with like throttle inputs, um and kind of adjusting that probably wouldn't have gotten quite so much traction control interference. And I was probably being a little bit hand fisted because I was also trying to keep up with our lead drivers, lead follow session, which is how a lot of these go. And the lead driver is Tom Christensen. Yeah, good who luck with that. Is the nine time Le Mans winner, um, oh. raced with Audi in the R8, R10, and R18, I think. Um, he was driving a an RS e-tron GT mm. and and it it was it was not easy keeping up with him and it it's a sign of how good he is at driving that he's driving this admittedly powerful but also very heavy electric sports sedan and easily staying well ahead of um, people in much lighter and more deft are Audi R8s. <laughs> I was going to say that's funny that like I think it's always a bit humorous when they do these lead follow things and it's like obviously you want the pro show you the lines and sort of being you know the the overseer but then they like sort of try to sandbag him with something like like that but it still doesn't make a difference you know it's like trying to tell a major league pitcher you know I don't know, throw from five feet farther back. You're still not going to hit, you know, uh, you know, Clayton Kershaw or somebody who's throwing 95 or 100, you know. So that's that's fun. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. V10, seven-speed dual clutch. That's a really great powertrain. Uh, I'm old enough that I remember when the R8 was offered with a six-speed gated manual, which was just pure magic. I mean, the flax you would get from going into gear, especially like, you know, going into the up, upper gears, if you will, the pulling back down, one of the best manual transmissions I've ever driven. So, um, and it's really something too, I think, uh, you know, the way they're setting this car out, um, you know, they're promoting it, they're doing a program, they have this kind of special GT edition uh, that they're offering on its way out. Um, it really captured the zeitgeist of the like late 2000s decade into the 2010s as far as like really powerful supercars that you know reminded everyone that like luxury brands could do great things it was this it was the lexus lfa um you know it was it meant something to enthusiasts at a time when the acura nsx had just gone away um you know we were seeing the return of pony cars at that point like the challenger and the camaro and this car was right in there as far as like sort of, you know, reminding enthusiasts, hey, things are, it's going to be okay. Cars are going to be here for you at all different price points. And then we saw what would follow, you know, with the Corvette, that the mid-engine Corvette, you know, the next NSX. Um, Lexus sort of really got its mojo back with design and all those big V8, five liter V8s. Um, obviously not all directly related to it, but, you know, the Audi was among the first. And, you know, I think Audi is one of the luxury brands that does perhaps the best job of translating its like 
racing history into like road going models. It, when Audi was just dominating ALMS back then, they had this road going car that was right there for you. If you were like, you know, a big fan of, you know, the ALMS teams, um, teams in Europe, of course, this was there and it embodied that. Granted, they were winning with like diesels, but you know, whatever, potato, potato. Um, so sorry to see it go. I think if there's any car that come can come back straight up as an electric, to me, the Audi R8 is it. Audi is already has access to that type of technology. I personally think the layout of a car like this would be fine. You know, it's it's certainly like, you know, like it's not a tiny sports car. It's not a Miata, if you will. Like there's room to hook up the batteries, get some motors in there, and you're good to go. Um, the design, I think, is timeless. This, the Chrysler 300, uh, and a few others of the last, say, 23 years as we're a quarter of the way through the century, they're going to hold up for another 100 years. So, um, you know, I would just say to Audi, you know, let's let's charge this thing up and get a new generation going that's electric. So, yeah, it, it'll be they haven't they haven't committed any particular direction as to a successor yet. No, I just uh, dreamed up a program right yeah, there and told yeah. them what to do. <laughs> and it's interesting because, like, yeah, it would be nice to see R8 continue. And I could, and like, like you said, I could totally see it being electric. Part of me kind of almost wonders if the direction that they might go and maybe, maybe should go is to just do something completely different for okay. whatever's next. New name, kind of new ethos and things because something that the Audi people were talking about was that the R8 it, it was very much a kind of celebration of their endurance racing ser uh, success. Yeah. And it was kind of designed to emulate a lot of the endurance racing car. So it was being like mid-engined and rear drive and having some styling connections to those vehicles. And with it going away, like a number of years after Audi has also, you know, left endurance racing, they don't do that anymore. Yeah. They are now focusing on going into formula one. And I kind of wonder if maybe oh. what makes sense for them would be to make something maybe closer to, kind of a road going formula car and maybe naming it something different that could take all kinds of different shapes. But I kind of wonder if maybe in some ways it should be like, okay, we're, we're closing, we're closing, we're closing the book of Audi endurance mid engine supercar thing. And we're going to, Oh, we're going to start a new book of whatever this new Audi supercar is. Since, you know, it's an Audi's entering a new kind of phase of its life. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, F1 offers new opportunities, you know, um, it offers new challenges, both for how you want to like connect with your car buying public versus, you know, the racing team. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. I could see the one challenge and I think a lot of it will be determined some things that are out of their control. Like if F1 takes off in the United States, they'd be crazy not to try to take your path and make something that's um, more connected to that. You know, if Drive to Survive kind of fizzles, you know, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe, you know, maybe they go down a different path. Um, you know, my argument is just the template they have, I think is timeless. You know, design is pitch perfect uh, and it's set up you know, to do whatever you want it to do. It could certainly be an outstanding hybrid too, if you wanted. So, um, yeah. Um, when you guys did the final laps, I'm curious, did they like, was there like champagne at the end? Like to me, it just seems like, you know, when I saw this program, I briefly considered doing it myself because it sounded awesome. You know, as far as like a couple of laps at Laguna Seca and an Audi R8. Um, was there like a celebratory mood? I don't know. I mean, what what was that like when they're like, this is it, guys? Uh, you know, oddly, 
not a huge amount of fanfare. Um, it might have just been that everybody was tired, and this was also like yeah, the th- and yeah. This was also like the third round of journalists that had gotten to yeah, do their laps fair. of the day. <laughs> um, but the designer of the first gen R8, Frank Lamberty, uh, when we were having our kind of history briefing and track briefing just a little bit earlier the uh, prototype in Le Mans race car class had taken to the track and there's a collector there with one of the one of the original Audi R8 race cars mm, okay. the Le Mans prototype version and it was out there racing and uh, Lamberty disappeared after he had given his bit of the spiel and I don't know for sure, but we all kind of suspected that he had kind of slipped away to go keep watching the endurance group of cars and to keep watching mm, the R8, yeah. which, you know, makes sense and can't blame him for that. <laughs> sure. All right. Cool. Um, any other Pebble vibes from this year? You know, Pebble Beach, Concours d'Elegance, anything from the week you takeaways? Sounds like you hit it all pretty hard. Just any thoughts there? Uh, it, it was it was a whirlwind of a weekend. Yeah. And it was neat to see the college that I went to, McPherson College, their, their restored Mercedes. This was the first time that they've yeah. brought a car to Pebble to compete that they fully restored at the college. And not only where they accepted at Pebble, they took second place in class, which is a huge achievement for anyone, uh, any shop. And like doubly so for the fact that it's a bunch of students that have been learning how to restore cars. Uh, That was really neat to see. And I think my favorite event of the weekend is definitely the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion because okay. of all the events there, it is the most kind of laid back and relaxed. And it feels like basically everybody there is there for the same reason because they like cars. It just happens that it just happens to be that some of those people are very rich and have, and have the cars that are racing. Yeah. Whereas it feels like at quail and at pebble, The vibe there is that there's a lot of people that are there because they're rich and it's the social thing Mm. to do. It's the high society thing. And they're just there because it's a place to hang out with their other rich buddies. It's not, it doesn't feel quite as sort of relaxed and, hey, we're all hanging out and having fun with cars. It's has a bit more of an uppity feel. So that's where, and I'll chime in here with my experience at the Woodward Dream Cruise. We were actually in a very pure Michigan weekend. You should cue the Tim Allen soundtrack and the, if you remember that commercial series from a few years ago. Um, we were in the Upper Peninsula and I came back uh, and I took, uh, you know, my family and I made it over there about, it was about 4.30, um, which it's still full, full cruise right up until like it's dark out and even then some. It's kind of the opposite vibe. It's just people are there because they love cars. And there's a ton of rich people there, too, to be honest, just because if you look at some of the cars, um, it's, you know, they're not cheap. Let's put it that way. Uh, But it's a very, you know, democratized event, if I could get that word out. Um, It's it's cool. You know, I went over to Past Diners, sort of that I I would call it iconic hobby shop right on Woodward. Um, You know, saw somebody do a burnout. Pretty cool. they had the unfortunate timing of the Oakland County Sheriff, uh, like a stream of motorcycle cops was just coming down Woodward just the same time. And this guy did it. I was like, oh, dude, wrong timing, man. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the, the Dream Cruise is evolving, too. You know, I think in some ways you are seeing more expensive stuff. Uh, I was talking to my neighbor who owns a like 0304 Cobra. And he was like, you're seeing, he noticed this too. You're definitely seeing fewer 50s and 60s muscle cars and fins like you used to perhaps even like 10 years ago. 
still plenty of that there. And maybe it's the time I went to. I don't know. You never know. Maybe that's more of an early bird show. Uh, you know, again, I did see plenty of that. But the cruise is evolving. You know, you're seeing more 80s cars. Um, again, I saw that SP2 Monza. I feel like there's a lot of people who are like, they have these things at like the, like the car clubs, you know, like M1, and they're bringing them out for the cruise, which is cool. Uh, share it with everybody. I think that's a great thing. Uh, I actually saw that at uh, not the Monza, but I saw another one like it. It was uh, another Ferrari. Uh, I saw it at the Past Diners Cars and Coffee and then at a local Troy car show as well. So you're seeing those things kind of, you know, <clears throat> dot the landscape as well. Saw a couple DeLoreans. That's always great. Um, yeah, it's just a good time. You know, you can like park in the neighborhoods and then just walk up and down Woodward. A um, lot of activations from the automakers as well. Ford um, usually does stuff. Uh, Stellantis, Dodge, they do things. Jay Leno showed up to kind of promote his car care brand. Uh, that was cool. Uh, I didn't see him, but that was cool. So, yeah, good vibe. GM has... Like it seems like multiple formal and informal stands. There's like a Corvette kind of, uh, I forget if they call it a Corral or if that's the Camaro Corral, but there's like a Corvette thing farther up Woodward. Um, you know, it's a big tourist thing. You know, you look around and you see um, people just, you know, like locals setting up coolers and lawn chairs. Then you see people who like clearly are like, you know, not from around here, if you will. And they're like, you know, there's a guy with like a French accent in line in front of me in this one shop buying some magazines and kind of chatting about how cool this was. So it's definitely become a tourist thing too, which is which is great. If you love cars, you can just show up. And to me, there's nothing better. That's frankly why I like cars and coffee so much is if you can get out of bed, you know, brew yourself a cup of coffee and get out the door, it's all you got to do. So. All right. So it's Woodward. That's Pebble. Um, we're going to talk real quick about the Sienna. I meant to tack that onto the R8. I've been driving that. I took it to the UP, logged 600 plus miles, performed like a champion, um, put a ton of stuff in it. The doors slide back and forth, which is amazing for kids and dogs, uh, fishing poles, golf clubs, everything fit. One of the great things about the Sienna is you can pack for a week up north and only fill it halfway. You know, I was looking at it thinking, man, any other car, even like a huge, like an Explorer or something, the way that like they're usually laid out is you get a cooler in there, you get some fishing poles, you get some golf clubs, it's topped off pretty quick. A minivan is just like, you know, it's kryptonite to, you know, the the problems of travel. So it's, it's great. Um, you know, nothing really remarkable about the driving experience. I've actually taken it to the Gulf Coast already. So I, I've, this is my second pretty long trip in this thing. Um, you know, enjoyable. I, let me see if I can pull up my fuel economy here. Yeah, there it is. I, um, yeah, I averaged it's spot on 30.5 and 30.9 miles per gallon. Um, so, you know, that's actually a little bit less than what a lot of other people have been getting, but, um, you know, Hey, still very respectable. Oddly, I paid the same for gas in, uh, it looks like in the UP as I did uh, in Metro Detroit. That's kind of an interesting quirk. Um, but yeah, it's good. Have you, been, have you been in the Sienna yet? I know it's been here nine months. It's making its way through the staff. You must have at this point probably had a stint in it. Yeah, I was actually the first one to get it. And the first one. So you're due. Yeah, and I drove... I drove it out to the Chicago Auto Show. Oh, yeah, that's right. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. Okay. I, How come? You know, it's comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and it's efficient. But i not a big fan of that powertrain. It yeah. is slow and it is noisy. At least when you want it to go somewhere and at any kind of pace. <laughs> uh, I I mean, I can't fault the efficiency. And again, it's comfortable. But yeah, it's... 
It just is very unhappy anytime you request it go quickly. Would you? Yeah, I would agree with that. I drove an eco mode a lot too because I wanted to save every drop of fuel I could. I just, you know, with a 65 pound golden retriever and the whole family in tow, you don't want to be stopping for gas if you don't have to. It's just one more complication. Uh, so yeah, it can be pretty darn slow, but um, you know, I don't know. I think we've had this debate with James Riswick, our West Coast guy. Um, he loves this thing because it's the hybrid and it's a set it and forget it. Whereas we also have people in the other camp who are like Pacifica is the way to go because it's it's a plug-in hybrid. You get that 30 miles of electric range. And if you charge it, you don't really use much gas. So I can see it both ways. Yeah, I think I'd land in the Pacifica camp. And part of it, part of it being that I do like the fact that the electric range gives you that extra flexibility. And <laughs> also the fact that the electric motor was coupled with a V6. So when you did ask something of it, even if it still wasn't like super quick, it didn't sound so extremely strained. Oh, and also the fact that the Pacifica is not a CVT or eCVT. Yeah. It, you know, has an actual like conventional automatic transmission in there. It, it just didn't sound anywhere near as strained. <laughs> yeah. I, I go back and forth among these two, and the Kia Carnival is pretty good. The Honda Odyssey is very good as well. A lot of options in that segment. I feel like I'm forgetting one, but it's you didn't have this many choices a few years ago. So I still think I lean on Pacifica a little bit more. Uh, I'm just very aware of the whole like, okay, you've run out your 30 miles per gallons of a 30 miles of EV range, then you're driving around with a Chrysler Pentstar V6 and a bunch of batteries. So that's to me, that's a bit of a problem, but a lot of people use minivans just for their like sort of suburban circle. You may never use gas. That's the other side. So, all right. Should we spend some money? Let's, uh, this comes from Reddit's Our Cars thread. If you uh, have a spend my money question or you want to get into our kind of casual mailbag that we'll drop into the show from time to time, please let us know. That's podcast at autoblog.com. Drop me a note. We'd love to discuss your car slash money problems. Also, you know, if you're on Reddit, you want to, you know, kind of offer some feedback on the thread where we kind of grab these from occasionally, feel free. Uh, all right. So this is kind of an interesting question as far as V8s. I became an enthusiast late in life. I need a daily. Never owned a car with a V8, but I want something new and reliable over the long term. Tell me I'm crazy for eyeing, uh, uh, this is a Lexus IS500 over a BMW M340i. I realized for daily and commuting uh, that I don't care about small performance differences because it doesn't matter. That's a very, uh, I think, observant uh, point there is you don't, whether you're going zero to 60 and 3.1 or 3.5, you're not going to notice a difference. 400 horsepower is about the same as 450 on the street. So, well, you know, good call here. So, a couple thoughts here. I think one, is he crazy? No. Lexus makes some pretty enjoyable cars. In many ways, I think they're a little raw uh, than some of the BMW ones uh, as far as, um, you know, just their overall like, you know, vibe. Um, so no, I don't think you're crazy. Um, you know, the Lexus depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking at the Lexus ISF uh, and you want to get that five liter V8 with 472 horsepower, no, you're not crazy at all. That sounds awesome. I think you'd enjoy that immensely. Overall, I would probably still go with the BMW M340i though, just because I like the steering a bit better. I like the three series in general um, as my daily. So that's probably what I would do. What would you do, Joel? I'm in Camp Lexus this time. Camp Lexus? Okay. And should importantly point out, it's not an ISF at this point. It's the IS500 F Sport. And while it is a small distinction, it is an important one because the IS500 F Sport is not as hardcore as the old ISF was. And I'd say that having driven the IS500 and it's a little bit on the, it's a little bit on the softer side. It feels like a regular Lexus IS uh, F Sport with like the V6, except this one happens to have the big V8 in it. 
and it is a wonderful V8. It's a good one. Yeah. The Lexus 5 liter V8 is one of those, like, this is going to be remembered as one of those really excellent V8s. And, yeah. you know, probably one of the last ones, too. It just sounds amazing. It's got this, it revs up pretty high for a V8. So you can really enjoy, you can really enjoy it so smooth it's 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 a sweetheart of an engine um it looks cool too it's it's not it's not too over the top but it's got those little touches that help it stand out like the bulge in the hood and it's got the stacked the vertically stacked twin exhaust tips on each side of the back it it's a sweet car and it's and because it's not a full-on f it's pretty comfortable for daily driving like you can you can just kind of cruise around in it and it's just sporty enough that when you do want to drive it harder it's still enjoyable the bmw is probably a little sharper uh although i actually don't care for the steering in the three series because it's super numb like you can't feel much of anything i think the lexus is better in that department it's a heavier lift. I, I'll give you that in the Lexus. It's definitely a more direct connected feel. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't, I'm not necessarily the foremost expert on reliability, but I certainly haven't heard any horror stories about the five liter Lexuses and certainly everything else that's in it. That's not specifically specific to the V8, you know, is your typical Lexus fare. So it's not, it's not going to give you any trouble. Um, if this person is open to something that's not four doors, I would also suggest, well, actually, if I'm guessing four doors is probably necessary due to the fact that we're looking at both the IS and the three series, which are both four yeah. doors. Honestly, maybe consider a charger. <laughs> yeah. Um, Get one while get one while you can. Last call, right? Yeah, uh, because that's another fantastic V eight. Yeah, and you know the steering is a little bit. It's a little bit more on the vague side, and the interior is not as nice. But you do get more interior space because it is a little bit bigger than either of those cars. And while it's a little bit vague. Um, you know, the sportier, like the Scat Pack models, they, you can actually get them to handle pretty decently. Um, just as kind of an outside option. But overall, IS500 is a good way to go. It's a good looking car. It's got a superb engine and should be easy to live with. So I, I, I approve. It's a good choice. It's a good, yeah, like I said, I'm not saying that's a bad choice, not saying he's, I think the question is, is he crazy? No, you're not crazy. You're smart. Uh, I agree with you. That engine, to your point, uh, will go down is one of the iconic engines. Like I can recall two times off the top of my head, I drove that engine. I, one was, I forget the car, I think it was probably the IS500. I took it to Taco Bell. And another was the Coupe, uh, what was that, the LC? Uh, this was, uh, this is 2015, 2014, vividly remember driving it to go have dinner with my wife at my dad's house. I like that engine will stay with you. So, you know, again, not crazy. I do like the steering. Um, I'll double down and say, as far as a daily, I'd rather take that twin turbo 382 horsepower straight six. Uh, I like you know, just the overall drivability of the M340i. Uh, I like how it looks. I like the seats. Uh, I like the infotainment better than what Lexus does. So overall, if I were going to drive it every day, I, I'd go with the Bimmer, even though I do really like that Lexus. Charger is a great call. I could also see if you're like trying to like figure out what V8 you might want to get, you know, you make a great point there, Joel. He didn't say how many doors he wants. If you could go with two doors, Take a look at the Camaro, the Mustang, or the Challenger even. I, I would go Charger, though, if you're thinking LX platform. I think just based on the evidence here, you're going to prefer that. It's going to be a better daily because the Charger or Challenger could be a bit of a rough daily. Uh, 
But hey, look at a pony car too. I mean, they have great V8s. You can still get them while you still can. Literally, this is the time right now. It's the last model year for the Camaro and the Dodge. Mustang's going to hang out for a bit, but a lot of options. So, all right, that's the show. Send us your spend my money. That's podcast at autoblog.com. If you like the podcast from Autoblog, that's five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Be safe out there, and we'll see you next week.